Good morning, church. Hope you're keeping warm. I had um, a distinct honor and pleasure a couple weeks ago of spending a few days in Colorado, in the plains of Colorado, at a buffalo ranch. Um, we actually call them bison here in the U.S. Buffalo actually is a cow. But uh, I, was, I spent four days over the weekend at a buffalo ranch with a buffalo rancher named Sean Bennett and his lovely wife, Carrie, and, and one of their sons, 16-year-old son, Kale. And um, just great fellowship with a fellow brother and sister and, and their son, um, learning about buffalo and um, actually getting to harvest one. And they took me and a, and a group into their family, and we got to dine with them and they served great meals. But more importantly, they served really important life lessons. So one life lesson that I learned was that while we were eating, I always noticed that um, their son, Kale and everyone else would take their cap off. And on a buffalo ranch, they always wear a cap. In fact, I bought this from their ranch. They always wear a cap. It's something that is really a part of their uniform when they're ranching. And um, Sean, who you could say was typecast straight out of Yellowstone, rugged man, strong, strong personality, strong in stature. And, um, you know, we had a great fellowship. We had a great dinner that night. And I noticed how respectful his son, Kale was. So the next day while we're eating together, I said to Sean, I said, Sean, I'm so impressed with your son, Kale. I'm so impressed with the respect that he has for others. Yes, sir. Yes, ma'am. Taking his cap off. And Sean said, you know, Mark, we, um, we always made respect a cornerstone of our family. And for example, when we come to the dinner table, we always take our caps off. And the reason why, and, and it's gotten to a point where our sons, and they had four sons, they'll self-police. So if someone comes in with their cap on and they're sitting down, another one of the sons will say, hey, Canaan, you got somewhere to go? And Canaan would go, oh, I'm sorry, and he'd take his cap off. And so here we are, Midwesterners from St. Louis, we've got our caps on at the dinner table. And of course, as he's telling this, we're all slowly taking our caps off. And for me, the reason I wear a cap is usually because I have really bad hair. And I don't like to take my cap off. It kind of, it's something I hold on to. I want to look good in front of you. So um, we're taking our cap off and trying to straighten out our hair. And I, it really made me realize, after meditating on that for a while, and I said this to Sean, I said, Sean, taking the cap off isn't the really important thing, is it? It's really about the heart condition. It's really about coming to the table and putting everything else aside. No matter what your hair looks like or no matter what your, your face looks like, it's about coming to the table, showing respect for one another around the table, being fully present, putting the world to the side and being with one another. And he's like, that's exactly it, Mark. It doesn't matter if it's the cap. It doesn't matter what it is. It's about being at the table, being present, setting the world aside, and being with one another. And it was such a great lesson for me because I oftentimes come to the table with a cap on. Sometimes the cap takes the form of a phone. Sometimes the cap can take the form of something that happened at work that still is in my mind, that's in my heart. Or it could be rushing to do something else. I oftentimes bring my cap to the table. It's such a great lesson in life. And I told Penny, I said, I learned such a great lesson from Sean that I no longer will bring a cap to the table. Because oftentimes, 
I bring my phone to the dinner table, and sometimes I'm doing work. Whether it's at a restaurant in lunch, for lunch, or, or whether it's during dinner itself. So this morning, I want to ask you, what's your cap? What cap are you wearing right now? Love the verse in Revelation 3.20 where Jesus says, I stand here and knock at the door on the door. If you open the door, I will come in and I will dine with you. What prevents you from opening that door so that Jesus can come in and dine with you? I'd love for you to just take a moment before we start our worship and think about your cap. What cap did you wear when you came into church today? Just take a moment. Think about what that is. Take the cap off, open the door, and let's dine with Jesus. This is such a great opportunity, week before Christmas, to just dine, open ourselves, put our heart condition, this week especially, this week, to be present with our Savior. Just take a moment. So our call to worship this morning is from the book of Isaiah. Isaiah 9, verses 6 through 7, which says, For to us a child is born, to us a son is given. And the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. And our confession of sin is from Isaiah 1, verses 3 through 4. The ox knows its owner, and the donkey its master's crib. But Israel does not know. My people do not understand. Ah, sinful nation, a people laden with iniquity, offspring of evildoers, children who deal corruptly. They have forsaken the Lord. They have despised the Holy One of Israel. They are utterly estranged. And with that, our assurance of forgiveness from Isaiah 9, verses 1 through 2. But there will be no gloom for her who was in anguish. In the former time, he brought into contempt the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali. But in the later time, he has made glorious the way of the sea, the land beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the nations. The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who dwelt in a land of deep darkness, on them has light shined. Let's pray. Lord, in this time, in this season, in Ecclesiastes, Solomon wrote that there's a time and a season for everything. And yet in Daniel 2.21, you said, Lord, you change times and seasons. You depose kings and raise up others. You give wisdom to the wise and knowledge to the discerning. Lord, we are so grateful that what you desire in all times and seasons is for us to walk beside you, much like you did at the very beginning when we got to walk in the garden, when we got to be fellowship with you. Lord, we know that if we all open up our heart, if we open up the door as Jesus invites us to, that we can fellowship with you directly, that we can walk in the garden Because where you meet us 
is in our heart. You meet us in our heart, our heart condition, and that's where we can dine together, Lord. And Lord, we just pray today that you would help us, that through your Spirit, our hearts would be right. We would know that we're forgiven because you redeemed us, because you sent Jesus, sent Jesus to redeem us, to shed his own blood so that we can be in fellowship with you again. Lord, thank you for that so much. Lord, we um, pray in this world that you would heal those that are in a state of illness. Lord, I think about um, my friends in China right now, just seeing their posts, just being positive with COVID when they went through the last few years without experiencing it and having that sickness and many of our friends um, going through that, Lord. Lord, we just pray that you would be there, that you, out of all things, would receive glory in the country of China. We also pray, Lord, for what's happening in Ukraine and other parts of the world where there is conflict. Lord, it's a difficult, difficult season to be in conflict. And Lord, we pray that what's, what comes out of that is, again, for your honor and for your glory and for many to be saved uh, through these circumstances. Lord, we know our prayers matter. In Revelations, you said, in the smoke of the incense, with the prayers of the saints rose before God from the, from the hand of the angels, Revelations 8. Lord, our prayers matter. And may we embrace our prayers and often get on our knees um, to pray for those because you listen and we thank you for listening. Lord, now come in and dine with us. Pour your spirit upon us and inscribe in our hearts your words and show us your way. We pray that you use Pastor Paul as a messenger for, your, for what you want to share with us and how you want us to come closer to you. We thank you, Lord, for this time. In Jesus' name. So this morning we come to worship our Lord and King. Um, the Bible says that He is the image of the invisible God and He is the firstborn of our creation. And the book of Colossians even says, He is the full, the, in Him the fullness of God was pleased to dwell. Um, so let us, let us raise up today, let us stand up and worship together. And remember that uh, is, our hope is in Him and He is who we are waiting for. He is our true prophet. He is our blameless high priest and He is our true king.
is beside it. Thank you, worship team. Awesome. Don't you wish we could sing those songs all year long? Um, I don't know about you, but I love turning on the radio and telling Alexa to play holiday music. It's one of the favorite times of the year. Um, you know, another area that God seeks our heart is in this area called tithe. Um, and I, loved, I love this verse from Malachi. Um, it says, and th there's a key word, the word bring. It says, bring the full tithe into the storehouse that there may be food in my house. And then he, um, he actually exhorts us. He says, and thereby put me to the test. This is God saying this. Put me to the test, says the Lord of hosts. If I will not open the windows of heaven for you and pour down for you a blessing until there is no more need. Key word being bring. He doesn't say give it to me. How can you give something that was never yours? It's God's. God gave it to us. He just says bring it. Bring the full tithes to me. And I love that. It's another one of those of being present, the heart condition, being fully present. So during this time of tithe and offering, um, we're just going to take a little bit of time to bring, not give, to bring. And um, let me pray for that. And then uh, I think we're going to have a missions moment. Lord God, we're so not worthy of the gifts that you continue to give to us. Certainly the heavenly gift that you gave us through grace and the earthly gifts, no matter what they may be, whether it's little or it's much, Lord, it's, we know it's from you. And we, we are so thankful for the opportunity to bring some of it into the storehouse. Lord, for your kingdom, so that your name will be edified. Not ours, Lord, so that your name and that your promise be fulfilled. Thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name. So as we bring up the sermon PowerPoint, 
Um, this morning, Eric is going to read the passage because it's actually relatively long, um, and I kind of wanted to get somebody else's uh, voice in here. And so when Chris gets up the uh, PowerPoint, we'll move forward and the children can be dismissed. And this morning, I want you to think about a, a nativity scene. Do any of you have a nativity scene at home? Um, you know, we often bring one out. Um, you know, at Christmas time, there we go. And this morning, I kind of want to help clarify um, some truths, historical truths about the nativity scene and how it brings things together that are actually separate. But Eric will read, this is Matthew chapter 2, verse 1 through 11. Um, and we want to think of our Christmas gift as the birth of our Messiah. And if Christ simply means the word Messiah, any place in the Bible where we see Jesus Christ or Christ Jesus, we should think of the word Messiah. So uh, we can think of Christmas as messiah -mas, if you will, because that's what it actually refers to. But here we're going to read um, from Matthew chapter 2, the story of the Magi. I will be reading from the ESV. Now after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, the day of Herod the king, behold, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we saw his star when it rose and have come to worship him. When Herod the king heard this, he was troubled, and all Jerusalem with him. And assembling the, all the chief priests and scribes of the people, he inquired of them, where the Christ was to be born. They told him in Bethlehem of Judea, for uh, so it is written by the prophet. And you, O Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, um, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For from you shall come a ruler who will uh, shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod summoned the wise men secretly and ascertained from them what time the star had appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem, saying, Go search diligently for the child, and when you have found him, bring me word that I too may come and worship him. After, after listening to the king, they went on their way, and behold, the star that they had seen when it rose went before them until it came to rest over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they rejoiced ex uh, exceedingly with great joy. And going into the house, they saw a child with Mary, his mother, and they fell down and worshipped him. Then opening their treasures, they offered them, uh, him gifts, gold and frankincense and myrrh. Good, thank you. Let's pray. Um, God Almighty, we do pray that you will help open up our hearts this morning um, and come to stand in awe and amazement of what you have done in Jesus, how you, the eternal, infinite God, became a human infant, a baby, for our sake, to rescue us, and not just, God, a certain group of people, but to rescue the world and to offer the gospel. And I pray that you'll help us to understand what it meant, God, that you have included us in your covenant people and that you have included us in your chosen people. I pray, God, that this morning that we would embrace and be grateful and stand amazed in your word. In, your word. in Jesus' name I pray, amen. Um, I'm going to move this aside if you don't mind. So the question is, how many of you do have a, a nativity scene at home? Oh, I'm surprised. I thought all of us would have some kind of nativity scene. Um, a thing about nativity scenes is they're actually different from one area of the world to another because we all approach Christmas culturally in very different way. You know, and so I was looking up some things, and, and I tell you, I, I want to go to the Philippines for Christmas. Um, 
Now, I'm going to tell you why. Now, look at this nativity scene up above. You see baby Jesus in the middle, and then you can see that people are dressed, you know, with that kind of Filipino shirt. But notice what's in front. I, I, I checked on this. Th this is roasted pig. How much better than turkey? Turkey that is so dry and, 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 you know, and if you look at this plate, it's actually really interesting because there's a whole bunch of, you know, little bing or little pancakes. And it kind of looks like, if you will, Beijing Kaoya, the Beijing duck. I checked, I asked, it's not really what is normal. Normally they eat something, they eat the roast with something called hanging rice. And that is kind of a rice thing, they wrap it up in leaves and then they hang it upside down for a little while and then they use the, the rice to eat the roast. But the nativity scenes remind us of Jesus. The nativity scenes that we have actually, in many ways, bring together two stories that historically and chronologically are separate. And, you know, this scene from Peru, where they're dressed as Peruvians would, in some ways is much, much more historically accurate because on the night that Jesus was born, shepherds were there. The shepherds came with the sheep, and there is a truth that they may have been in a stable, or, because we hear this word in, that there was no room in the inn. But the truth is, the word for inn is a word that also means upper room, and the houses um, in Israel at that time had a couple of layers and down a couple of floors and down below were where the animals stayed. So they actually may have been in a house. We are uncertain about that. But what I do know is this. The Magi who came um, to Jerusalem probably came much, much, much later. Uh, one, he's born in a house, or they are in a house, not in a stable, they aren't in a manger, and two, the word that is used is child, and then three, they ask about the time, and Herod is concerned. He wants to get rid of whoever the Messiah is, and who does he kill? He kills babies from two years up. So there's a possibility, I would say likelihood, that Jesus may have even been two years old, but he's two years and under. He's an, not an infant, but he's actually kind of a toddler. But it's really important that we look at Jesus as an infant and as a toddler, and it's really super important that we see, that we re-examine these stories and see what the chief priests missed, and that we see in Micah and elsewhere that there are stories in the Old Testament that speak of why it is that the Magi come. Why would Magi come from the East? Why are a group of Persian or Iranian scholars or astrologists coming to the birth of Jesus. On the surface, it makes no sense. But if we look deeper, we're going to find this is a, a signal, and it's a really important signal to the people of Israel. So we have this story, and we open up, and Jesus is our Messiah. We have to get that. Jesus is our Messiah. And so it says, Jesus was born in Bethlehem in the days of Herod, and then there are these magi. Now, the Magi, we don't really know what it means to come from the East. It's not certain. But most scholars think that they were astrologers from Persia. And there's a question. Why in the world would astrologers from Persia come to the birth of the Messiah? 
You know, we don't stop and we don't think about that, but this is a really important question. They come to Jerusalem, they ask, where is he who is born king of the Jews? Why? Why would a group, if you will, in today's world, a group of Iranian professors and scientists, if you will, astrologers, why would they come to the birth of the king of the Jews? Why are they asking about the birth of the king of the Jews? And I think we need to pull out our nativity scene and look at it again. I read this really interesting story of a pastor, he and his wife. They had a party at their house, a Christmas party for a little small group of people, and then what they had was a white elephant exchange, right? So when you have a white elephant exchange these days, people come with kind of two sets of things. They come with little boxes and they're all wrapped up with Christmas paper, or they come with a little bag, and in the bag there's some tissue on top of it, and then they will have a little Christmas decoration on the outside, and then the gift will be underneath the tissue. So they are watching all of these people one by one. They're going around. They all got their little number. And then finally some little woman, she looks, what am I going to get, you know? And then she reaches over, and she picks up a bag, and then she sets it down, and she reaches in, and she pulls out baby Jesus in a manger. Now, there are three people who are shocked. One, this man is shocked, and his wife is shocked, and they look at one another because they realize that manger with baby Jesus is the one from their nativity scene. You know, so has this lady come along and stolen their nativity scene, you know, and thinking, okay, I have nothing to give, I'm just going to throw this in. But there's another lady, and she has this kind of a shocked look on her face. And what is concerning to her is, I put that gift together, and I did not put baby Jesus in there. And what they realized as time went by was that nativity scene was up above, and that somehow or another, Jesus got knocked off the mantelpiece and fell into the bag, and they're handing baby Jesus. And this couple is stuck with two things. How are we going to get baby Jesus back, you know? Because our nativity scene won't work without the baby Jesus that fits with it. But then the pastor starts thinking, you know, this is what I have to do at Christmas time. At Christmas time, Jesus somehow or another gets knocked out of the nativity scene. We could look at the nativity scene. We could do all of our little Christmas activities and then not really look at Jesus. And then he thought, you know, sometimes we need to take Jesus, if you will, from our Christmas story and re-look at him. And that's what I would like to do is ask two questions. Ask two questions. Re-look, if you will, at little baby Jesus or little child, toddler Jesus. Because remember, in Matthew, he is no longer a little baby. He's a child. He's in a house not in a stable, he's not in a manger, and it may be up to two years later. So we bring these things together, but we need to stop. And, and I think that there's a clue that if we see, one, why are Gentile, Magi, Persians, Iranians, coming to Christ, coming to the Messiah, why are they asking about the birth of the Messiah? And two, why is it that the scribes and priests do not understand what is going on? Because I think if they really understood and they looked closely at the Old Testament and what it said in, Mis in, in Micah, they would realize, oh, these Gentiles coming bringing gifts? they should really get us excited because this is the indication that the Messiah has arrived. What else is it that they missed? So we'll look at Micah in a little bit. But so what we get here is two things, and this is what I want to say, is if you look at Micah, we will see two things. One, Jesus is not a human being that will just live and die. He is God-man. 
And his birth is actually from all eternity. And two, if you look closely, you realize that Jesus is born as the Messiah for all nations. For all nations. But they miss it. They miss it. They're not really reading closely. They have a lens that keeps them from seeing what the Bible says. Because they are focused only on themselves. Their idea of the kingdom of God is not what Jesus is bringing. So first of all, we got to look at Jesus from all eternity. He is our Messiah. Anytime you read the word Christ, you should fill in the word Messiah. It will change the way that you think about Jesus. It will expand it and help us. So Herod, he hears these people. They come, these magi, and they're asked, where's the, where's the king? Where is he who is born king of the Jews? Where's the Messiah? Herod gathers the chief priests and the scribes, and he asks them where the Messiah is to be born. Not just a king, not just one of the Davidic kings in the line of David. They're asking a very special question, and that is, where is the Messiah to be born? So they ask, Herod calls them together and asks, where is the Messiah to be born? And then they just automatically, it just, just flows right out of their mouth. They, they, they remember one thing, but they miss the other things in Micah. So what they remember is, oh, this is in Bethlehem of Judea. Just five miles south. Just go along that ridge five miles south from Jerusalem. And then so they quote... And this quote actually is from Matthew. Micah's a little bit different, and I, I kind of, but I wanted to put in Micah so we get the idea of where it's from in Micah 5. It says, you Bethlehem of Judah, out of you, out of you will come forth a ruler. And then a few verses later, it says, and he will shepherd my people Israel. But if he's going to be the shepherd, there's two things to know. Why are Gentiles coming to the shepherd of Israel. And we got to remember, in the Old Testament, shepherd is not a religious leader. In the Old Testament, shepherd refers to kings. Not just in Israel, but throughout the ancient Middle East. So where is he who is going to come? And what is he going to do? He is going to be the king, lead, and shepherd my people Israel. If it's from Israel, why all these Gentiles? Are Gentiles showing up? What is it that they have missed? Well, one thing is that they have completely missed the fact that baby Jesus as an infant actually is God, the infinite, eternal one. Now watch this. In, in Micah, Right there, it says, his going forth, his coming out. When was Micah written? Over 700 years before. So you have to look at this from Micah's perspective. His going forth was from long ago and from days of eternity or ancient days. And both of these translations are correct. Long ago, and days of eternity, ancient days, that word is yom, yom, olam. And that word yom, it means day, or days. And olam can mean in the past, it can mean long ago, it can be ancient times, but it also means eternal. So there's the possibility, if they were reading this correctly, that they would have understood that the Messiah that has come to them and to us is eternal. He is the infinite, eternal God that is born as a child. Now think of what John does. John opens up. He opens up the gospel and says, in the beginning was the word, the word was with God, the word was God, but the truth is he was in the beginning. Days of eternity. And throughout John, 
Jesus uses this word, phrase, I am. I'm the bread of life. I'm the living water. I'm the light of the world. That word I am is really crucial because what Jesus does is he doesn't use it in a normal fashion. He has two Greek words, ego, amy. It means I am, I am. Ego, I am, amy. I exist, I am. And what he's doing is he's actually using this word throughout the Gospel of John that says, I am Yahweh. What do I mean, I am Yahweh? Because when the Greek translation of the Old Testament 250 years or so before Jesus was born, when they translated the word, I am who I am in Exodus 3, they translated it ego amy. So Jesus is calling himself Yahweh, God. That's why it is that they picked up stones to kill Jesus when Jesus says in John, before Abraham was, before Abraham existed, I am. I am who I am. That's essentially what he's saying. They picked up stones to blaspheme him because he was claiming to be God. But here in Micah, it's not just claiming to be God, it's claiming to be eternal. He is the eternal God. So we see at the time when Jesus was born, they were so concerned with a Messiah who purpose was to kick out all of the Gentiles, to kick out the Romans, to set up a military kingdom in Jerusalem with a throne in Jerusalem. They completely missed the truth that his throne is in heaven and his kingdom is across the whole entire world. He didn't come to be the Messiah only of the Jews. He came to be our Messiah, but he is eternal. And so when we come on Christmas, we should stop and, if you will, reach into that white elephant bag where Jesus fell off and pull out little baby Jesus and look at him differently. Look at him in total, complete amazement of who he is because he's not just the one who came to die for our sins. He is the infinite God who became an infant for us and our sake. In the Uffizi, which is this big, beautiful art museum in Florence, there is a painting by a Dutch guy, Gerrit van Hoenhorst, called The Adoration of the Child. And like so many of the Dutch at the time, there's a lot of work with shadows, with shades, with facial expressions. And if you look closely at the shepherds and you focus in on them, what you see are two little shepherd boys that were in fact there on the night that Jesus was born, that did see the star, that did hear the angels, they did obey and they come and they look. But look at that face, facial expression that the two of them have. That facial expression is one of just, I think, two things, astonishment and joy. And when we come to Christmas, we all ought to have a deep sense of astonishment and joy that the eternal, infinite God would become a human baby and infant. The infinite becomes an infant. That is an amazing thing. And so this morning, I would beckon all of us to just take a moment and thank 
Jesus that the eternal, infinite God became a human infant for our sake to redeem us. The second thing besides this that those scribes and priests completely missed, they missed. They didn't see this. They looked at Micah chapter 5, and they missed the fact that it says his days or his going forth are from days eternity. He's the eternal God. There's a second thing they missed. My question is, why is it that these Gentiles are coming and asking about the king of the Jews? Why do they travel? I mean, you've got to think, these are Persians, these are Iranians. The place for today, Iran is. By the way, did you know that the Iranian church is the fastest growing church in the world right now? We see all these protests, but what we don't know is thousands of people are coming to Christ every day. It's an underground church. It's a persecuted church. But God is doing amazing things right there. But why? Why these Persians are coming to Christ? So the Magi, they come from the east. They come to Jerusalem. They ask, where is he who has been born king of the Jews? And then they say something really interesting. We saw his star in the east. When did they see the star? Remember, that's what Herod was asking. When did the star appear? Why is Herod asking, when did the star appear? Because he wants to kill baby Jesus. He wants to kill the Messiah. He's pretending to want to worship him, but in fact, he is coming later to kill Jesus. What did they answer? They said two years ago. We saw a star two years. That's why it is that he tries to kill children from two years old and under. So they saw his star two years ago, and then for some reason, whichever month this actually happened, they traveled all the way from Persia or Saudi Arabia or wherever it had come, they had come to see the king of the Jews. The star is actually really interesting, and I think that when we look at the Greek, it's very different than we normally think. You know, I was kind of given the idea that, you know, I mean, it's really common, that there's the star of the Messiah was actually a conjunction. It was a conjunction of Saturn and Jupiter. And then there was a t that was in 6 BC. And then there was a little time when, in fact, what also happened was that Mars was there. But this is over a two-year stretch. This is nothing that just happened in one year and existed for a couple of months. But in Greek, it's really interesting. When they get done with Herod, what it is is they say, it, it says, the star that they had seen in the east, the star that they saw in the east two years ago, was going on and moving and leading them to Bethlehem. A couple of things. I think that this is God doing something completely supernatural. You may not agree with me, that's fine. Um, we just don't know what happened. Conjunction of Saturn, Jupiter, comet, supernatural, which is what I think. Because what it says is you gotta think. They're coming from the east, they see this star, and then suddenly, they're going to Bethlehem, and the star is moving on. Bethlehem is just down the road. Bethlehem is south. It's not to the west. It's not on the horizon. It's south. And it's only five miles away. And then what it says here is, it went on before them. It was leading them, if you will. And the two Greek words are inactive. They're, it's active tense. It says... They were leading, 
proago. It was actively leading them. Erkomai, they were actively moving. And then it said that it came and it stood. This is another verb. Three verbs that talk about the star. So this star, I think, if you will, was moving on ahead of them, and then it came and it stood over one specific house. You see, God is doing something amazing. God intervened in the whole entire universe and had this star, whatever it was that he did, and he led them to a specific house for a reason. And we have to ask, why did he do that? Why is God leading these Persians to the Messiah? And this is the thing that the scribes and the chief priests missed in Micah. So the Magi come and they said, where is he who has been born king of the Jews? We've come to worship him. Now, why? You know, I, I think that those ch chief priests and the scribes, that should have gotten them to wake up to the fact that this is truly the Messiah. Why? Because of the verse that they ignored. The verse that they ignored. And that is that in Micah, it specifically says, his name will be great to the ends of the earth. And the ends of the earth and nations are repeatedly used in the Psalms and in Isaiah and elsewhere to talk about bringing in Gentiles to the covenant people of God. And that's us. You see, we deserve nothing from God. We're Gentiles. We're not part of his covenant people. We are inherently not part of his chosen people, but God graciously brings us in. Isaiah 60 um, does a couple of things. Uh, one, it prophesies all of these Gentiles and kings coming, and I think that that's where the Magi should come. Secondly, if you read it carefully, and you look at Keter, Nebaioth, Sheba, Seba, there are these little mentions of tribes that are nothing less than the children of Ishmael in the Saudi Arabian Peninsula, at the bottom, all the way down at the bottom of what we call Saudi Arabia. And I have known that when missionaries to Muslims labor, and they labor, and they labor, and they have so little fruit that one of the things that keeps them going is these prophecies in Isaiah 60. But what it says here in Isaiah 60, in verse 3, kings will come to your light and all of the nations, the nations will come to the brightness of your rising. This is what the chief priests and the scribes missed because their mind was closed to so much of what God said in the Old Testament about Gentiles. Right there it says nations, kings, they come to your light. And then in two places it says they bring the glory and they bring the wealth of the nations to you. Now, we all know, or we ought to know, that in Revelation 21, in the description of the new heavens and the new earth and the new Jerusalem, this verse is quoted. So it's fulfilled in the new heavens and the new earth and in the new Jerusalem. That's when this prophecy is fulfilled. But it starts with the coming of Jesus when he is born. So when these people came, these Gentiles who have no part of God's covenant people or they are not part of God's chosen people, what it says is that 
they are fulfilling Isaiah 60 and Micah 5. They come, they fall down, they worship him. Unlike the scribes and unlike the priests, they recognize who Jesus is. And it says that they opened up gifts, their treasures, and they presented like a group, a delegation, a tribute of honor to the king, that is, to King Jesus. What did they present? Frankincense, gold, and myrrh. We all know this. Where does frankincense and myrrh come from? It was traded from the southern parts of Saudi Arabia. There was a a road where it came from. But the gold and the frankincense are in Isaiah 60. So what he's doing is he's saying the prophecies of Gentiles, us, coming into accepting Jesus as our Messiah begins on the day that these magi arrive. So we, I think today, ought to be in awe and ought to be amazed that the eternal, infinite God who existed before the beginning, word become flesh, has come and he dwells not just in the flesh but in the form of an infant. I've been struck by that all week. The infinite in the infant. The eternal God in the human infant baby. What a thing to be amazing. And secondly, we ought to be grateful because we have been included and brought into, as Galatians says, children of Abraham who are inheritors through our union with Jesus Christ who is the one seed, not the many seed, 316 Galatians, one seed. Our union with Christ is what makes people a true child of Abraham. We do not deserve anything from God, but it says that we have been simply grafted into as a wild branch, into the root of God's covenant people. This should amaze us. You know, and then in Ephesians 2, he talks about how we, Paul, talks about how we were excluded from the commonwealth of Israel, excluded. We were strangers to the covenant of promise, strangers, We were without God and having no hope in this world because we did not know the true God. But Paul there says, now because of our union with Jesus Christ, we have been made one people, the two have been made one, and we are no longer strangers, but that we are fellow citizens with the commonwealth of Israel. We should stand in amazement of being included into God's covenant chosen people by the work of Jesus Christ on the cross. It's an amazing thing when we stand here at Christmas and we look at baby Jesus, we look at our nativity scene, I do pray that each of us will go back and maybe maybe open up our eyes the way the chief priest and the scribe should have and kind of re-examine and look at and be amazed in an awe of the infinite God becoming a human. Acknowledge and honor Jesus as the Messiah of all nations and to thank him for his grace that he would graft us into his covenant people when we deserve absolutely nothing because of our sin and rebellion. Awe amazement, gratitude, and thanks. Let's pray. God Almighty in heaven, we do stand in amazement, we do stand in awe, 
and we stand in gratitude on Christmas. God, and we pray that you, God, will move in our hearts to help us to see things that we've never seen before in your word. Help us, God, to stand in that total amazement of the eternal God in a little child that is shown in a little tiny nativity scene. And help us, God, not only to look, re-look at baby Jesus, but help us to put him back into the center, not just of our nativity scenes, but the center of our lives. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. We thank Pastor Paul for the sermon this morning. And uh, let us stand up now and let us come adore our Lord and our King. Let us uh, take baby Jesus and and look closer, like Pastor Paul was just saying, and remember that our hope, hope comes from him and remember that just as he came, he will return and have that hope in our hearts and in, in our daily life. John saw us, a great multitude of people which no one could count from every nation, every tribe, every people, and every language standing before the throne and before the Lamb of God saying salvation belongs to the Lord. And may you and I and all of us continually wash our robes in the blood of the Lamb. In Jesus' name, amen.
Thank you for the message, Pastor Paul and the worship team. At this time, I'd like to welcome everyone here uh, worshiping and fellowshipping, and especially our visitors. And so if you're a visitor here for the first time, I would love to recognize you and then hopefully come and talk with you afterwards. Um, so I'll kind of span the, uh, the congregation sanctuary here, maybe start off with my left side. Any new visitors or returning after a while, if you could just raise your hand. Great, if you could wait for an usher to give you a, a microphone and please introduce yourself. My name is Charlie. <laughs> Charlie. Friend of Perry Smith, and uh, you know. Great. Nice meeting. Great, nice to meet you. Thank you for coming. <laughs> and uh, any on my right side, your left side? No? Well, welcome everyone. Great to see you. Uh, hopefully, we'll see you all here again next Sunday. And uh, we are hoping to run out of seats next Sunday. So please come next Sunday, bring all the visitors in your house uh, before you get all filled up with food that night. Come here first and get filled up by the Spirit. Um, secondly, or thirdly, please join us for lunch today. Uh, I didn't know we were having lunch and I was kind of excited that we have tablecloth service later on today, so please stay in fellowship with us. And then um, a word of celebration, Madeline and Andy Kim welcomed their second child on December 11th at 4.21 a.m. I don't, it doesn't say what time, like central time or, or uh, it was central time, okay. <laughs> um, so their new son's name is Samuel Sung Soon Kim. Pretty cool Korean name. <laughs> Um, so please take a moment uh, just to reflect on the message today and um, join us for lunch. <laughs> <laughs>